Hi. Um, so, uh, as you heard, I'm Jason. Um, I do a lot of things at Gatsby. I currently am focusing almost entirely on developer relations, uh, which involves a lot of doing stuff like this, um, writing educational materials, building courses, things like that. I, prior to this, was at IBM. I was actually trying to get Gatsby implemented at IBM, which is how I got connected to Gatsby and ended up getting the job in the first place. And uh, I live across the bridge in Portland. And what I want to talk about with, with GraphQL and why Gatsby started using it, um, the first thing that you think when you see a static site generator um, using GraphQL is, well, that's over-engineered. So a lot of times we hear that. People look at Gatsby and they go, Man, this is a lot of horsepower for a static site generator. Like, why would you do that? And the reason that we do it is because even simple data has pretty complex relationships. So as an example, let's take a look at my, uh, my blog. So this is a blog post. And by all accounts, this is kind of like a fairly standard setup of data. You, you would see this on most web pages, some, some combination of things like this. So in addition to just the regular content, we also have an image. Um, in addition to an image, we have a category, we've got tags. And if you start to map out these relationships, this starts to get really complex. You've got um, not just like a post to author relationship, but then an author is a one to many relationship a uh, post can potentially be many-to-many -many relationships. You can have multiple authors. You then have uh, images, which need to have a relationship to the post, and may be used elsewhere on the website, so there might be more relationships there. And that's before we even get into the categories, the tags, the pagination, all those sorts of different things. So as you can see, this data it starts to get really complex in a hurry. And the way that you'd see this managed in a app that has a server running might be something like a relational database. And the way that you put together a relational database, I realize this is very small. Don't worry, you don't need to be able to read the content. It's just to illustrate a point. You end up having uh, posts, and those posts will have an ID. And then you have authors, and those authors will have an ID. And then you would have comments, and the comments have an ID. And then you have these relationship tables, which would just map a post ID to an author ID, or a post ID to a comment ID. And in order to get that data back out, like this is very normalized. If you've uh, if you've ever done like database design, you may have heard really mathy sounding terms like first normal form and second normal form. And I don't know what any of that means, but I'm pretty sure this is third normal form. Um, then when you start getting at this data, you have to make a bunch of different calls. So you have to get the post so that you can get the post ID. Then once you have the post ID, you have to make a call to get the author. And then once you have the author, then you can go get the author's details. And then you can go get comments. And there's this whole chain of requests that need to be made. And this gets a little gnarly to manage, especially when you're doing it all on the client side. Because now it's not, like you're no longer just saying, hey, give me a post, I want to display some data. You're now having to know how the database works, how the data is structured under the hood. And that makes it, you're starting to push business logic and database logic into the front end. And that's a recipe for disaster. When I was at IBM, I saw them trying to solve this in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways that I saw was that every single front end was supposed to be just a front end, but it turned into a full app. They were running a node server. They had an API proxy in front of it. That API proxy was basically querying everything that it might need and then exposing its own API, which would then call the other APIs. And as you can imagine, nobody knew how any of this worked. So this can get out of hand in a big hurry. GraphQL turns this back into a front-end only concern. You describe the data that you want, and you don't necessarily have to care where it comes from. You just know what data you need. You're saying, I want a post, and of that post, I want its title, its body, the author's name, the comments, and then for the categories, I want the name, but not only that, I want all the other posts in that category so that I can show related posts, right? Now, if you're gonna do this with a, like a REST approach or a relational database approach, it gets, like you can do it, you can obviously do it. People have been doing it for a long time, but there's a lot to manage. And if you make changes, it requires a lot of refactoring of the code to make sure that it all works. So in GraphQL, you have a much more flexible approach here. If we want, if we want to change the way that you get those posts, those related posts, under the hood, the GraphQL server can completely change. And as far as the front end development team is concerned, nothing changed.
So this more strongly decouples the front end from the back end with a more explicit API contract. Um, and I've seen teams try to handle this by creating bespoke endpoints. They'll create a REST API that only delivers what the front end team needs. And that's a good solution sometimes. But on bigger teams, what ends up happening is that bespoke solution becomes two bespoke solutions or 10 bespoke solutions, or in IBM's case, about 1,500 bespoke API endpoints that nobody knows whether or not they're being used, whether or not that data is necessary. Um, they can't deprecate or delete things because they don't actually have visibility into where in the company. You know, IBM's got 400,000 people working there. They have no way of knowing what's being done. They don't have that type of instrumentation under the hood. So once you put up an API, you maintain it forever. And that's not really a sustainable way to do things. So with GraphQL, because of this very flexible front end structure, it is always a bespoke endpoint because I can just drop the category off there or I could add in the author's email. And any of those things that I do doesn't affect the underlying database structure. It doesn't affect the REST APIs. Now the API team can deprecate something and say they don't want to give me the, the posts anymore, I would get a warning, but it would still work. And eventually it would just stop returning data, but it would never break my app, right? So this is a way to kind of enforce separation without enforcing extremely high context communication between front end and back end teams. You have this kind of buffer layer. I, I call it a middle tier that normalizes the data in a way that makes sense for back end teams and makes sense for front end teams. So Gatsby goes a little bit further with this. And the reason that we got into GraphQL in the first place is because we have no idea what people want to do with the data. And because we, like, we don't even enforce data structure. If you want to do blog posts, great. But we also allow people to pull in data from WordPress or Postgres or whatever they want. And that means that we needed something more flexible than a like traditional strict API. So we need to do something flexible and we use GraphQL to do that. So with GraphQL in Gatsby, you can query things like the site metadata and page information. You can just say, I want all the site pages, and it'll just give you a list of everything in the navigation. So then you can do things like dynamically build your nav. Um, we will let you query the file system. So you can say, in this folder, I want all of the files, or I want all of the images in this folder, however you want to do that you can get third-party data out of our GraphQL API. So you can pull in WordPress and Shopify in the same query if you want. And then we also allow you to set up relationships between data from multiple sources. So if you make a, let's say, a, a Twitter API call and you want to get the avatar, we will allow you in that same call to get a local version of that Twitter avatar that's been pre-optimized for lazy loading and all the, uh, the performance tech, like performance tuning that you should be doing, we just do that for you for free so that you don't have to find the time or argue with management about why you need a sprint to do performance. So what this looks like to kind of visualize it is we can take data from any one of these sources or you know any number of other sources, basically anything that exposes an API or that can deliver you a JSON object, we can take and put into the Gatsby GraphQL layer. Once you have that, we expose that as a single GraphQL endpoint that you can query inside of Gatsby. Um, you use React to deal with the data that you've queried. Once that's done, we compile it down to static assets. So you're just gonna get a folder full of HTML, JSON, JavaScript, and CSS. And once that hits the browser, it rehydrates into a single page React app again. So you get all of your dynamic capabilities. You wanna do async calls? Absolutely, you can do that. You want to run, you know, stateful client React apps? Cool, you can do that too. You want like client-only routes with authentication? Absolutely. So all of those things are, are possible inside of Gatsby. Um, we just build it in such a way that when you're doing the static stuff, you don't have to worry about all of these complex sources of data. We kind of call this the content mesh. We think about this idea that where traditional CMSs and apps would have kind of a monolithic backend where all of the data had to go through that monolith to get to the front end. Um, and you would find yourself doing things like if you've ever worked in WordPress, you would have a WordPress blog and then somebody would say, hey, we want a forum. And you find yourself trying to shoehorn forum data into a WordPress blog. And it's a huge pain and it's prone to breakage. And it doesn't really make sense because your, you know, your forum posts have like post slugs and, and all this post metadata that they shouldn't have. 
which is just confusing and odd. Uh, it was even worse if you started doing e-commerce. And when you use Gatsby, the content mesh is this idea that you should choose the best tool for the job. So if you want to do e-commerce, go out there and grab Magento or Shopify or whatever it is that you, you know, just use plain Stripe. Uh, you want to do a blog, cool, go get Contentful or Sanity or WordPress or Drupal or whatever your, your preferred flavor is. And then we stitch all that together. So you've got a single data source and then you have a unified way of building that front end, which is also very easy, very approachable. So, you know, the idea is that you shouldn't have to make trade-offs. You shouldn't have to, you know, force your team to use one CMS to manage data or force your developers to deal with this nightmare of disparate API endpoints that they have to then reconcile and manage on the front end. Um, we're looking to find the best of both worlds here. So to show a little bit about how this works, I'm just gonna live code some stuff. Um, so everybody wish me luck, hold my beer. Um, so what I wanted to do is let's just start with some plain data. So what I've got right now is, uh, let me make this a little bit bigger. Can everybody, whoops, go back to here. All right, can everyone read that? Is that big enough? Okay, um, so what we have right now is a kind of plain vanilla Gatsby website. So if I run uh, Yarn Develop, what we are going to get is basically nothing. So this is my hello world. Um, we get that by creating a page called index that spits out hello world. So this is kind of a, a, the very first way to get data into Gatsby. You can create any React component exported from the pages directory will become a page, uh, will display that. So that's good, you can do a lot of things with that, but if you wanna do something programmatic, we have APIs available for that. So I can come down Let's go create a new file. I'm gonna create a file called Gatsby Node. And this one is designed to allow you to hook in to run like build time APIs. One of those build time APIs that we have is called Create Pages. And Create Pages gives us a few things. The one that we need is actions. So whenever we run one of these API hooks, there are actions you can perform inside of it. Uh, all those get bundled up into this great little actions object. And the one that I want to use is called create page. So I'm going to say, let's create a new thing. We'll call it uh, no data. And then I need to tell it what component to use. So I'm going to use, um, I don't know yet. So let's, let's build one. So I'm going to create something. We'll just call it templates. Uh, this is a, a naming convention. You can call it whatever you want. And I'll just match it up to the page. So this one is going to import React from React and it will export default. Um, see if I can spell. Program, oh God, program, no. Programmatically. Uh, ship it, okay. Um, so <laughs> and yeah, no kidding. Um, so source, templates, and no data. So I tell it where to get that data from, and then I am going to save. I'm gonna stop and restart. And what we will see is that upon building, I can go back out here and I can just visit, whoa, no data. And we see that page. So we are able to just choose any React component and drop things into it. So. That's useful, kind of, but like, what if I want things to be dynamic? What if I want to send like different content to different pages? The way that we can do that is we can add something called context. So let's add another one. And for this one, I'm gonna do two things. We will do, uh, let's say Vancouver and Portland. And I'm making this up as I go, so let's see how it goes. Um, so for each city, I'm going to create a page and we'll set this up at, uh, let's just do city to lowercase and then we will do uh, the component is going to be, we'll have to make this, but we'll call it require resolve. Uh, we'll go source templates and city.js and then we're gonna pass in context. So I'm gonna give it a city 
and we'll just make it the city. So let's go over here and build this component. So city.js, I'm gonna import React from React, and now I can just put something out here, and let's say I wanna be able to get that city, and how do we get this out, right? So Gatsby is gonna take anything that we put into that context object and create a prop called page context. So I can then just go page context.city and upon saving this, what should happen What did I do? I don't think you can have an array like that as an expression without a semicolon before it. Still. Fine. I didn't set up the prettier config, I always use semicolons, so I don't actually know how any of this works. All right, let's see how it goes. All right, um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna trigger a 404 so that we can see what got created. Now it created both Portland and Vancouver, and if I click into it, we can see that it picked up that, that city from context. So now we can do variable data. Now we can build pages based on information that we're feeding it, and that's great. So if we wanna take that a step further, Maybe we want to get like complex data out. So let's say we've got these three products, and I did these ahead of time so that y'all didn't have to watch me try to write that. Um, we can take these three products and we can try to get them in to our stuff. So let's do that. I can take, where is it? No, this, this one? Not that one, this one. Okay, um, so I can go into my Gatsby node again, and I can just, up at the top, let's do products, and I'm just going to require this data. Uh, what is it? What was it called? Products. Okay. So I have products.json. Now, is the require syntax the only one that's supported? Uh, in the Gatsby node, yes, but not for long. We okay. we're in the process of dropping Node 6 support because Node 6 hit end of life. Um, so you will eventually be able to use ES modules everywhere, but for now you got to use the, the node syntax. Um, so we've got our products and I'm going to do another for each and we'll grab out the product and we can do actions.create page and we'll do path and this time let's do, uh, did I add a slug to these? Yes, I did. We will do uh, product product.slug, and the component is going to be, um, we're gonna use require.resolve source templates product, and for the context, I'm actually just gonna put in the whole product. So this, actually let me do it this way. We'll, we'll make it a named, a named thing. Um, so then in here, I can get product.js, and let's, uh, let's look at the data. So for each of these, I'm gonna import React from React, oops, from React, and then I will do uh, export default, then we can get that page context out, and I'm just gonna destructure this right down to product. So we've got this, and I'm gonna do, let's do, I don't know, we'll do a div, uh, an h1, we can do product.title. Uh, then down here, we're going to do a uh, paragraph and do dangerously set. Thank you, I'm dying. Um, is it all uppercase? Yeah? Let's find out. Um, and then. Do the PA system. I'll use my radio announcer voice. Um, all right, so then I've got my product description. So I'm gonna do a product description, and then we can do something like, I don't know, let's, uh, let's just set the price up here. And we'll do product.price. Um, don't need a dollar sign, because I included it in the data. But we will put it into parentheses, and uh, I think that's probably enough for now. I guess we can put the image in. So let's put in an image. Uh, it'll be the image source is product.image, uh, we'll add an alt tag for accessibility, product.title, and we're probably gonna need some styles to make that not look completely terrible, but let's go ahead and 
double check this, give it a shot. Let's see what happens. Okay, we got products. So, our product broke. Um, our images broke because they're not actually accessible at the place where they seem like they should be accessible at. So this is kind of confusing, but we're looking for these images at like a relative path. So in order to make that work, um, we can't with a relative path, not the way that this is designed. We would instead have to do something like this. Uh, you know what, I'm not even gonna bother. You'd have to put them into a static folder, you'd have to rewrite all the URLs. It's a lot of work, it's not that fun, you shouldn't do it. So instead what we're gonna do is we're going to start using Gatsby's GraphQL layer and see how this can get a lot easier. So let's do this by, uh, we're gonna create a Gatsby config next to our Gatsby node. And then I'm going to have an object that and The first one that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up Gatsby source file system. Uh, I pre-installed all these in case the, the Wi-Fi wasn't super fast. So uh, normally you would have to install these from NPM. And for the options, I'm gonna set up a path and I'm gonna make that path data. And upon doing this, uh, I can run yarn develop again. It's gonna pick up, well, nothing, because I did something wrong. Gatsby source file system, did I break it? It's right there. You know you have this. I guess we do have to watch installs. We got fiber. Oh yeah. All right. Did that work or did that fail? Fun. Okay. Um, so this is a this is a problem that we are currently trying to deal with, which is that. Uh, Sharp is a temperamental pain in the ass. So whenever you install Sharp from a different version of Node than the lock file was created in, everything explodes. So you have to delete the lock file and try again. So this should solve the problem, assuming that, uh, you know, it's not one of those days. Sharp is image processing. Sharp is a, I believe, a C library for uh, doing image processing. And we use Node Sharp, which is a wrapper around Sharp, uh, similar to like if you've ever used SAS. Uh, and if you've ever used SAS, then you know how much of a pain it is to use the C libraries that are installed through a Node wrapper. Um, so we have all the same, the same challenges. Um, stuff we're working on, we're trying to do upstream uh, contributions to like make this less of a hassle. But in general, if you just figure out what version of Node was used, and just use that version of Node, your life gets a lot easier. Um, but we're all good here, so let's go ahead and run Yarn Develop. And so, again, what I did is I set up Gatsby Source File System, let me close this, to read that data folder. And so if I come in here, I can now open up uh, localhost 8000 slash GraphQL, and this gives me um, our GraphQL Explorer. So this will let you look at the whole thing. And if you click this doc button, these are auto-generated so you can see what's available in here. And we can see we've got the files, we've got the site pages, um, the site directory, all that stuff. So what we're interested in here is I want to look at the files. Um, so let's look at file and I don't know, let's see what's, let's see what's in here. We'll do a public URL. That's not a very useful thing. So let's do a uh, all file, and then we'll get the nodes out. Get out of the way. And let's see, maybe something easier. Uh, absolute path, how about that? Okay, so in doing this, we can now see we've got this JSON file, and then we've also got these, uh, these images. And those have all been read in, but at the moment they're not super useful. There's not a lot we can do with these. But if we add a couple more plugins, we absolutely can. Let me make sure that I've got these installed. So I've got the Gatsby Transformer JSON. 
which is going to look at that JSON file. And then I've got the Gatsby transformer sharp along with the plugin sharp, which is like sharp utilities that are going to look at those images and convert them into things that we can use. So let's add those to our config. And because we don't need any options, I can just drop them straight in as just the names. So Gatsby transformer JSON, Gatsby plugin sharp, and Gatsby transformer sharp. Uh, order shouldn't matter here. So once I run yarn develop again, we should now be able to start look, okay, so now we've got images, we've got products. All right, we're in business. Let's look at the products. All products, I'm gonna grab the nodes. Um, nodes is just a, it's like a category theory shorthand for like the stuff in this collection. Um, so no, it, when you see node, that just means a thing, like whatever the thing is you're searching for. And now that I'm in here, I should be able to get, see there's our title, we can get our slug, I can get the image, um, and uh oh, we got an error, what's going on? Let's look. Oh, look at that, it noticed that it's a file. So I can now go under here and I can say that the image needs to be a thing. So let's see if I can get some useful information about it. Um, what about my public URL? Now, what happens if I just load that? Oh snap, it just works, right? So this is, uh, this is what's really exciting about the GraphQL layer is like, you don't have to do this work. You install a plugin and we'll create those data relationships for you. We see that it's JSON. We see that that JSON has relative image paths in it. So we go look for those images and we turn those images into file nodes. And we also do things like uh, create the optimized version. So if I wanna do a fluid width image and I want that to be whatever the right source set size is, we'll also generate all the different sizes. So if you look at this, this is a 200 pixel wide, 400 pixel wide, 800 pixel wide and 1200 pixel wide version of that image, which means that on responsive screens, on a small screen, the browser is only going to try to load that 200 pixel wide. That's less transfer. That's a faster load. That's going to look right for the screen. It's not a compressed image. Um, so you're getting a lot of benefit for free here because we're doing that on your behalf. And one of the ways that we're going to solve uh, even a little bit further than this is we can also go in and give you a, a helper that will grab that image and show it. So how are we doing on time here? We good for like another 10 minutes if I keep rolling? Okay, all right. So what I can do now that I've got the data into the GraphQL stuff is in this Gatsby node, I can do something even, I'm gonna just get rid of these so that we can see what's going on. Um, so now I have actions, but I also have access to GraphQL. And because we're all hip and cool using ES six or whatever it is. Uh, I'm gonna use async await so I don't have to write promises. And I'm gonna use this, I'm gonna get uh, a result back by awaiting, or nope, I'm gonna await the GraphQL call. And in this, I can just make whatever GraphQL call I want. And so what I want is actually just the ID and the slug. And so when I run this, this is gonna give me back a unique identifier for the data node um, and a slug, which I can use to build the URL. So I'm gonna grab this, I'm gonna copy paste it out. This is another thing that's really powerful about GraphQL. You can test your queries in the browser and copy paste them straight into your code. So I'm just gonna paste this in, I'm gonna drop that comment because we don't really need it. And now I can do if result.errors uh, we can just do console.error uh, result.errors and then we'll, we'll return because we're not actually error handling here like you should probably do better than I just did. Um, then we can say that our products are going to be uh, result.data. So the way this works is GraphQL is going to return an object that has errors and data. Uh, when there's not an error, data comes back with whatever the result is. When there is an error, errors will come back with an array of whatever errors occurred. And 
since we didn't get an error, we can go right in to the data object and we want to get all products dot all products JSON dot nodes and that will be our data. Once we've got those, I can do a products for each and in oops product and I'm going to again grab actions dot create page. The path is going to be product product slug just like we did before. The component is going to be let's just reuse that product component that we made and we'll uh, clean it up a little bit templates product. And for the context all I'm going to send in is the ID of the product ID. Okay so if I save this let's go into the product and all that I'm going to get out of this is actually the ID. But that's okay because what I actually want to do is I want to use another GraphQL query. So this is where GraphQL is also really useful is I can instead of having to pass all that data into the context where I then have to like console log that context object to see what's in it or something kind of confusing. Instead I can just look at the GraphQL query that will be co-located with this component to see what data is available inside of it. So let's write the query that we want. So I want to get a product by its ID. So let's say I want to load this vintage purple T. I'm going to copy paste this so that I can do some testing. And I'm just going to set an ID and we'll set it here. Then I can write a query and I know that that query is going to get this uh, ID variable that I just set because that's how this playground works. And I want to get my product JSON and I'm going to uh, filter. I want to get the one that uh, the ID equals the ID. And inside of it, let's just make sure this works, I'm going to get the title. Okay, so now I'm getting this product by its ID. And I want to be able to get out the uh, description I want to be able to get out the price and then I want to be able to get out the image but again the image is now a file so I'm going to get the child image sharp I'm going to get the uh, the fluid with or let's get the fixed width version and I'm going to make that a 300 pixel wide image and I want to get um, I'm going to use a fragment so there's one limitation that's kind of confusing here we have these convenience fragments but they don't work in the playground. You have you can only use them in uh, in Gatsby proper. We're working on a fix for that. It should be out somewhat soon, but for now, unfortunately, you kind of just have to know. So I'm going to grab this query, and I'm going to take it up here. We're going to import GraphQL as a named import from Gatsby, and then down here, I'm going to export a constant called query and that is going to be the result of a tag template literal containing our query. And I'm going to rewrite this to use that fragment. So it's going to be Gatsby image sharp fixed. No, that doesn't sound right. Let's look this up. If I look up Gatsby image, Gatsby image sharp fixed. Hey, I did it. Um, so this now is making a query for everything that we need to display this component. And instead of coming in as page context, because it's a GraphQL query, it's going to come in as data. And Gatsby, this is just kind of a, a build time feature of Gatsby. We're going to look for any exported queries in page components only. We don't look at any other components in the, in the thing. So unless it was created with create page or a file in that pages directory, we're not going to look for queries. But in these, you can export that query. And any GraphQL query that gets exported, we will grab, we will execute, and then we will inject into this component as a data prop. So this data prop is going to have data.productsjson. And so I can simplify this a bit. And let's say the product equals data.productsjson. So now I have all of my information except this isn't going to work anymore. So 
what I can do is let's just comment that out and instead let's dump what we got. And let's dump the product.image and we'll make that look nice. So once I save this, I'm going to rerun my query. And once we come back over here, we can see that that fragment that I used, it gives us a base 64, uh, which is like a data encoded image, a width, a height, a source, and a source set. So those are all the things that we need to show a, uh, a responsive image. And I can demonstrate this. Let me make sure that I've got it installed. Yep, I've got Gatsby image. So in my product, I can import image from Gatsby image. And then down here, instead of using that image, I can use this one. We'll say fixed equals product image child image sharp fixed. And again, that's product image child image sharp fixed. It works just like a JSON object when you get the result back. Add an alt again, we'll do the product.title. And then I can get rid of this. And now, We've got an image. And more importantly, we've got an image that is lazy loaded and your internet is too fast to show me. So let me, uh, let me throttle. And what we'll see is that the image is gonna pop up blurry. Oh buddy. and then it fades in as high def once the image finishes loading. Um, now because we're using the development version of Gatsby, we haven't done any perf optimization, which is why that took like 15 seconds. Um, so what this means is that while we get... Is it base 64 the blurry image? Yes. Yeah, so actually that's a great thing that I should have pointed out. Thank you for the reminder. This is what gets generated by Gatsby image. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So what you'll see is that we start by doing an image wrapper. This is how we set up the aspect ratio for the image. And that's a placeholder so that it always looks the right height and width and you don't get content jumping when you, um, when you load the page. So then we set up an image. That image has this uh, data, this base64 encoded image as its source, that acts as our placeholder. That is a low quality image, and when you blow up a 32 pixel wide image, the browser will blur it to try to make it look as good as it can. Then we use a picture, and inside the picture we use a source set, and that source set will show you what is, uh, what's being loaded here. And we can see that the size is 300 by 400. The current source is this one here, which if we match that up, it's the one that starts in DE, oh, they all start in DE209, um, F709C, so this one here, which is the one and a half, pic, or the one and a half pixel density version. Um, so it looked at the browser and decided, based on the browser dimensions, this is the one that I should use. So this is, uh, you know, this is kind of one of those things that's like, all of this is made possible without manually creating all of these images because we have those data relationships in Gatsby. Because I can look into the files and then break those files into nodes and look at those nodes and figure out what kind of nodes they are and then apply transformations to them, we're able to do all these things in a way that is significantly simpler um, where we're able to say, you know, just give me this product and I want this information about that product and then I know down here that this prop is gonna contain whatever that query says, that's a really powerful model for building front ends. And that doesn't change when you switch from using a, a JSON file to using WordPress to using Drupal or accessing a Postgres database directly. It's always gonna show up as a query that's either you know the thing or all thing, and then you're going to access it like this. So you know this is, uh, this is something that I, I hope, like, does anybody, does anybody feel worse about GraphQL after watching me talk about it? Okay. 
I always worry sometimes that I'm showing this stuff off and people are just getting like, why, why? Um, but so anyways, that's uh, a kind of a, a very fast paced overview of GraphQL in Gatsby and what you're capable of building with it and what it unlocks, um, those performance optimization things. So with that being said, that's all I got. Does anybody have questions? Um, when I was starting to use it, my only frustration was some of the, the data got super deep, but so you're just drilling, 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 drilling down to get like one properly down there. Um, how does GraphQL handle like restructuring data? Is there any way to like reformat the data so it comes in in more of the same manner, so it's flatter, or um, will that be maybe doing more of a middle layer to like write your own plugin for it, or I mean, you can, yeah, so you can absolutely do that. Um, another thing that you could do is, like, here we're, we're querying the product, but let's say you only wanted this image and you didn't want to have to go, like, data.productjson.image.childimagesharp.fix. Um, instead, you could do something like image sharp, and then we could run a filter. Yeah. So I'm going to do a filter based on the, I don't know, let's do uh, original. So there's no way to, like, alias that source down to the, uh, no, you would do the, you would do that in JavaScript. Okay. Like it's because I just didn't know if GraphQL had. Yeah, GraphQL doesn't have anything like that. You can restructure your queries to make them easier. So, like in this case, what I was going to do is just grab out like I can grab out this uh, Riggins image, and we'll do. And you can pull out that same image. So this would make it smaller. Um, another thing you can do if you don't want to deal with the names is you can uh, you can like alias. So instead of having child image sharp, this renames it to sharp. Um, so there are ways that you can do it to make it more um, like intuitive to yourself. So like if I wanted this to be like products, then it just starts to simplify. So now I've got products dot image dot whatever. I think what if you change data sources? structure of the data sort of changed, you don't have to go back and like redo all the queries to match the data source. Okay. So does it, I, I have something to show you. Does anybody have questions before I go off on a deep tangent? <laughs> okay. I'm gonna show you something wild. Um, so this is something that we've been working on that is definitely not what I was here to talk about tonight that I'm really excited about right now. Um, let's open which one? Uh, this is Mm, somewhere in here. Come on. Here? Here? Yeah. All right. So what's cool about this is uh, we're working on something that we call data or schema customization. And so the way that schema customization works is you can say, I want to create a type. And so this is a generic type. And I'll just walk over here and start pointing at things. So what we've got here is this event comes out of a JSON file, but I aliased it to be called event, and then I know that I want certain things to be in certain format. So I want the start date and end date to be dates, so that I can do things like uh, query it with a from now, um, and then it would say like two days ago or something, and then I can proxy it from a different file or a different field name. So now when I query this data in the the um, in the actual template files, what's happening is I'm just grabbing like, let's see here. I'm just grabbing out like start date and end date, like you know the things that are in here: name, location, URL, start date, end date, uh, and those get fed in through these templates, which are kind of set up to be, you know, ID, start date, end date, whatever. So if I were to go into my data, and let's say that this got changed to start, right? So instead of having to go through and refactor my entire code base to find all of those queries and all that stuff, I would just go in here and I would refactor that. And now everything continues to work. Could you do nested, like if it's a couple layers down? Eventually, yes. Okay. Like this is all super new. Yeah. So <laughs> I mean, that's the idea is like you've got a component and you know the schema that you want to do in that component. And you yeah. Want Exactly. Then the next question is, when are you getting TypeScript? 
<laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Do whatever you want. We have a plug-in for TypeScript if you want to use it. Um, yeah, any, any questions not about TypeScript? <laughs> this is the first time that you could define your own GraphQL types in Gatsby. Uh, yes, that feature was, uh, it was, it was rolled out in like basic form earlier this year and they've been slowly adding more and more features. So like the proxy stuff, um, here, this is weeks, maybe a month old. Um, so this is all like brand new stuff and it's going to get more powerful. We're also looking at things like my dream and what I'm pushing them toward is I want to be able to dual source data. So I want you to be able to specify like a blog post type and then I want you to be able to drive data into it from Markdown and WordPress so the marketing team can write in WordPress and the developers can write in Markdown and they don't have to fight about whose content is more important. Um, so that's also coming. Because the way the node interfaces are set up, they expect a single data source. So we ha we're implementing uh, interfaces, basically. So there will be like a MDX blog post interface and a whatever interface, and there will be adapters. Those adapters change MDX into the generic, and then the generic gets aliased by like the generic type. And if you don't understand that, I barely understand it myself. <laughs> That's super cool. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so they work uh, like this. These are all things that I haven't released yet. Um, so this is a plugin course that I'm going to release someday, and it shows you how to add nodes. So like this is how you would put data, where is it, here, here. Um, so if you've got an array of data, and like this would be whatever came back from your API. Then in this source nodes API, you can just call create node. These are fields that are required by Gatsby. So as long as you require an ID and then this internal object with a type and a content digest, you can add literally any content to Gatsby as long as it's serializable. Uh, this is, um, we're basically doing a SHA hash of the content of the node so that we can tell when it changed. Oh, cool. And so that leads us toward things like incremental builds where we only rebuild the part of your site that actually changed rather than having to rebuild the entire thing. We have working demos of that. It's not quite ready for prime time, but that's coming this year. That's gonna be great. Yeah, that's going to be huge because that actually unlocks things like you could run a site with more than like 20, 30,000 pages on it. Right now that gets to a, a pretty long build since you've got to do it every time. Uh, it also unlocks things like if you have a, a e-commerce site that updates every minute or two, um, that's actually feasible with incremental builds. Any other questions? Has anybody tried Gatsby? Good. Is anybody wanting to try but hasn't had a chance yet? Does anybody think Gatsby's terrible and think I should leave? I was really expecting at least one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for anybody who, I, I know that you're about to come up, so I'll say one thing and then I will leave. Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, so I'm on Twitter and I fairly regularly, like every one to three weeks is the cadence, will put on just kind of what I call beers at beer. Uh, my friend Kyle Shevlin and I started doing this. It's not a meetup. It's just an unstructured way to go hang out with other nerds. So it's typically at a, a bar called Beer in Southeast Portland. It's great. They got a back room. They turn off the music for us. It's mostly private. And uh, it's just a good chance to hang out with people. So watch my Twitter. I always tweet about it at least a couple days in advance. Um, I also have a newsletter for it if you want to get a heads up whenever we schedule one. But uh, we'd love to see you there. It's, uh, it's always fun to get more folks out. <laughs>